Join me now in a word of prayer as we ask God's blessing on our time in his word. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for your greatness and your goodness to us. I thank you that you are a God who is not only great, you are great in your amazing creative powers to fashion the heavens and the earth in six days through your spoken word. But you're not only great, God, but you're good. And we thank you for that goodness. We thank you for your goodness to us to be compassionate, to be merciful, to have long suffering, and to forgive us when we sin against you. And so if there's anyone who is watching this, who is in here this morning, who is in need of your goodness, who is in need of your forgiveness, may they come before you today knowing that you are faithful to forgive our sins when we confess them before you. You are faithful to give us eternal life when we believe in the death and the resurrection of your Son and his promise of eternal life. And may we trust in that faithfulness day by day, no matter what hardship, no matter what pain and suffering comes in our life. May our rock, may our foundation be your goodness and your faithfulness to us. And in the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. Turn with me in your Bibles to Romans 3. We're going to be in Romans chapter 3, and we're going to look at verses 1 through 8 of Romans chapter 3. At times, a break in the action can be the most welcome thing. At other times, it could be the most frustrating or even painful thing. One thing I've discovered since I've begun to run for long distances is that the only thing worse than continuing to run after 9 miles or 10 miles is to stop running and then try to start running again. I've had a few times where after I was running for a long distance that I stopped for a short period of time and then got up the will and the mental power somehow to start running again only to have my legs scream at my brain, no, what are you doing? The rest was good. You should lay down and take a nap. Don't keep running. While running down the streets of New Orleans, the one thing that I always dread is oncoming traffic because I do not want to stop for cars that are going down the road. And there are times where my body is yelling to my brain, I don't care how fast that car gets going, you're going to beat it because you are not going to stop. Stopping and then starting again can be rough. And for eight verses now in Romans, Paul is going to stop his momentum. He's going to stop his momentum on his argument that is why we have all fallen short of the gospel. He's going to start to deal with three objections that he believes a reader may have to what he has presented on man's sinfulness. And I'm guessing that as an experienced presenter of the gospel, Paul has had many, both Romans and Jews, who have raised their hands, stopped him in mid-sentence in his presentation and said, but Paul, what about this? Or how does that fit with the law? Or are you saying we should do? And I applaud Paul for his willingness to stop his momentum to confront these objections head on. I applaud him for not sweeping them under the rug and pretending they don't exist, and even and especially for dealing with objections that you can tell frustrate him, ones that he finds to be ridiculous and baseless, but yet he confronts them anyway. So Paul, in our verses this morning, is going to deal with three objections to the teaching on man's sinfulness that Paul presented in Romans 2. And as we tie these three objections together, and we see how Paul answered each of the objections, what we're going to see clearly is that the, that the answer to each objection to the gospel is the faithfulness of God. For the people of God, our foundation, our grounding in this world is always to be the faithfulness of our God. So where do I turn when in a broken world, nothing seems to make sense anymore? I turn to the faithfulness of God. When the arguments of others cause you to doubt your faith, go to God's 
faithfulness. When you sin, don't rest in your own good works, hoping that the good things you're doing today will outweigh the bad things that you did yesterday, but instead go to the faithfulness of God. Paul here is going to do two things in our passage. First, he's going to deal with these three objections to the teachings in Roman. But second, when we tie them all together, Paul is going to show us that the bedrock of our Christian faith is the faithfulness of our Lord. With that being said, let's look at the first objection in verses 1 and 2 of Romans chapter 3. Then what advantage has the Jew? Or what is the benefit of circumcision? Great in every respect. First of all, that they were entrusted with the oracles of God. So Paul here brings up the first objection to what he taught in Romans chapter 2. If the end result of legalistic obedience to the law If the end result of obeying the law resulted in nothing other than hypocrisy and pride, then what advantage does the Jew have who possesses the law? What advantage is there to circumcision? Or as I would restate the objection myself, what's the point of being Jewish according to the law? What's the point of being God's chosen people if moral living only results in hypocrisy and judgment. So someone could be saying, Paul, you seem to be suggesting that we take everything in your family history and we throw it all away. Do you really want us to get rid of the law and the prophets and the kings and the promises? And I think you could say that there's a chance that we might expect Paul to say, yes, Let's get rid of it all. Let's clear house. All you need is Jesus Christ. Let's get rid of the old to make way for the new. But Paul doesn't say that. In fact, he says the exact opposite. He pushes back against this objector who's suggesting there's no advantage to being Jewish. But Paul says there is a great advantage no matter how you want to look at it. And while we expect him here to go upon a long list of benefits to being one of God's chosen people, uh, Paul only has time to give us one example. It is great to be one of God's chosen people. It is great to have this Jewish heritage because they have been given the word of God. It is the Jews who know the true story of the creation of heaven and earth. It is the Jews who possess the Mosaic law, the greatest law code of justice the world had ever seen. It is the Jews who held hundreds of prophecies of the Messiah. They had so many countless stories of the heritage of the power of faith in the Lord, the stories of Abraham and Joseph and Joshua and Samuel and Ruth and David and Elijah and Daniel and Esther. The gift of God through his word, allowed God's people to trust in the faithfulness of the Lord. Because through his word, God proved himself to be dependable again and again and again. And to me, here's the great thing about these verses is that Paul could have picked some aspect of Jewish heritage or promises that were only made to the household of Israel. A promise that was given to Israel, but not to the church. But he stead and chose to proclaim a benefit of Jewish heritage that is given not only to the church, but has expanded in the church age through the New Testament. So if someone was ever to come up to you and say, what is the advantage of being a Christian? We should instantly be able to respond, there are so many advantages of being a follower of Jesus Christ. We have every privilege that truly matters in Christ, and where it starts is with our Bibles, with the Word of God. It is through the Scriptures that the Spirit has provided us with dozens, hundreds of songs 
that can speak to our depression, our pain, and our longing, and also can rejoice with us in victory and in hope. It is through the scriptures that the Spirit gives us hope in tomorrow when the world around us calls us to be people of despair. And we have this hope because God has shown that all of his promises since those he made to Noah when he said he would never flood the earth again, to promises that God made to Isaiah, that a child would come who would be the wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the eternal father, and the prince of peace, that God has fulfilled his word again and again. So in the midst of your darkness and anxiety today, when objectors come to you and try to drown your faith with the worries of this world, in your confusion, grab the rock. And our rock is the truth of God's words. God's faithful promises from the one who knows the beginning and the one who knows the end. I had terrible asthma as a child. And so I received lots of booster shots. I had shots once a week, and then every other week, and then every month for years when I was a child in school. And I hate shots. I never became comfortable with the pricks and the pain in my shoulder. So later on, when it came time when other people asked me to give blood, my excuse was always, I've been shot and pricked with needles enough times. I don't need to do this now. I will pass. But the truth is, I was just scared to give blood. I was scared of the pain. I was scared of the blood. I was scared of what unknown feeling I would have when my blood was escaping from my body. I didn't really pay very close attention in biology class, but I was pretty sure that the red liquid that's in my body is supposed to stay in my body. But after moving down to New Orleans, Brother Dave introduced me to the Kinchins. And of course, those of you who know the stories of John and Anita Kinchin, if I was going to be introduced to John Kinchin, there was only going to be one place that I could do it, and that was in the hospital. And I always enjoyed my visits with the Kinchins. And when I heard that John was in need of blood, I decided it was finally time to face my fears and give blood. And I went to the blood donation area at East Jefferson Hospital. And I went signing up. And I was so afraid. I, I was shaking. I was sweating over what was going to happen. And then I finally gave, and it was, it was easy. There was really nothing to be afraid of outside of a little pinch of a needle going in. And then when I learned that I was A positive and John was A positive, and so my donation was going to go directly to him, that made me want to give all the more. And I've been giving blood ever since then. And today I have no fear to give blood specifically because I know how it's going to go. I know how it'll begin, I know how it'll end, and I know that it will help others. And this is the advantage with having the Word of God, the oracles of God. God in His Word tells us how it begins. He's going to tell us how it's going to go, and He's going to tell us how it will end. And the one thing we learn throughout the Word of God is that God is faithful. So when His people hold on to His Word, we can be strengthened with the greatest advantage and comfort given to both Jews and Christians alike. God is faithful to His people in His provision of His Word. But an objector might then say, well, what happens when God's people are faithless to Him? Is God faithful when we're unfaithful? Or does God go back on his word and on his promises and prove to be just as fickle as the rest of us? Well, let's look at how Paul confronts this objection in verses 3 and 4. What then? If some did not believe, their unbelief will not nullify the faithfulness of God, will it? May it never be. Rather, 
Let God be found true, though every man be found a liar, as it is written, that you may be justified in your words and prevail when you are judged. The second objection to Paul's teaching in Romans chapter 2 is found in verse 3 of Romans chapter 3. So if you want to make a note in your Bible, verse 1 and verse 3 of Romans chapter 3, those are not the words of Paul, but they are words of someone who is objecting to Paul's teaching in the previous chapter. And here the objector says, can we still count God as faithful if his own people fell to condemnation. So when you look at the history of God's people, how can you say that God was faithful to Israel when they were conquered by the Assyrians? How can we say that God is faithful to the Jews during Paul's day when they were dominated by the Romans? How can we say that God is faithful to the Jewish people when the majority of them have rejected their own Messiah? And to this, Paul gives a very short and swift rebuttal while using a quotation from Israel's greatest king, no less, as his support. And Paul's answer is simple. We may lie, we may fall, but God will continue to stand tall and speak the truth. We may fall, but God will be consistent. The failure of the Jews to believe in their Messiah did not rest on the shoulders of God, but it fell on their own shoulders due to their hard-heartedness and their unwillingness to believe. The judgment and the exile to the Babylonians was not because God turned his back on his own people but it was due to their own sin and the promised judgment that God would bring in faithfulness to his covenant with them. The judgments of God on his chosen people are not a sign that God is being unfaithful. It's not a sign that God has rejected his people. But what it is is proof that God is faithful. It is proof that God will deliver both the blessings and the curses in accordance with his word. And no one knew the reality of God's faithfulness in times of righteousness and in times of sin than King David. Romans chapter 3 has a quotation from the Old Testament in the final two phrases. And that Old Testament quotation comes from Psalm 51 verse 4. And if you know the background of Psalm 51, Psalm 51 is David's soulful response to the Lord following his sin with Bathsheba and his murder of her husband Uriah. And in this prayer, David confesses his sin and he pleads to God for forgiveness. At the beginning of Psalm 51.4, David confesses his sin He confesses how evil he was before the Lord. And then David testifies that even though David is a sinner, even though David has fallen, his Lord, his God is still just. The Lord is right in his words and his judgments. That's what we see in the final phrase of verse 4 when it says that, and prevail when you are judged. Now that phrase can legitimately be translated two different ways into English. The first meaning is that if someone else was to judge the Lord for his actions, that the person who would judge the Lord would find him to be the victor when they passed judgment upon him. In other words, no matter how people may judge the way that God put judgment upon David, if you try to pass judgment on the Lord, he will pass every single time. God is right in his judgment. Now, I prefer to translate this phrase a different way, which is, and you triumph when you judge. So when God's judgment of others, when the Lord passes judgment, he will be the overcomer or the victor in the judgments he delivers. 
In other words, God is simply right. He is correct. He has the standing to pass judgment upon his people. This is David's confession, that regardless of the punishment that Yahweh will bring upon the king of Israel, the Lord is right to inflict that judgment and to inflict that punishment upon his servant. So the Lord is faithful to judge. He is just to pass judgment upon those in his community who do not believe and those who do not obey his word. When we fail, the Lord is faithful to us. And how is the Lord faithful to us in our failures? He is faithful to pass judgment, to bring conviction of sin upon our hearts. When God judges his people, when the Spirit brings conviction into your life due to your sin, this is not a sign that God is faithless. It does not mean that God has abandoned you in this hour, but it is a sign that God is true to his word and to his holiness and to his faithfulness in the discipline of his own. I feel like I've used this as an illustration too many times to count, uh, but I, like all good fathers, I discipline my own children way more than I discipline anyone else's children. If someone else's child makes a noise or disrupts the service in some way. If there's a family that comes into the church and they have a baby with them and that baby starts crying in the middle of the sermon or if a six-year-old begins to complain loudly, it doesn't really bother me at all when children make noise in the service. When I hear that noise, I always think the same thing. I would rather them be in church and making noise than at their home or at the park or doing something else making the noise. I want everyone to be hearing the word of God. But on the other hand, when it is my own children in church, and when I hear my wife need to shush Elias, or I see her giving Isaac the look because of what Isaac has just done, that does not make me happy. My boys will not have a good afternoon if they are disobedient in the morning. I discipline my own children in a way that I discipline no other children because they are my responsibility and because I want to be faithful to them as their father. The Lord made Israel his responsibility when he called Abraham and his descendants to be his own. And the Lord has done the same for the church today. So when we walk in unbelief, when we sin against God, when Israel was faithless at times in her history, God's judgment on them, God's judgment on us is not a sign that God is faithless to us, but it is a sign that God is faithful to us even in the midst of our sins. God is faithful to his own character and he is faithful to his children. So to the doubter who questions, we will always rest in the faithfulness and the goodness of God that is found in his word and that is displayed in his response to our actions. And now we come to the final objection, uh, the one that probably was the most common objection to uh, all of Paul's ministry and the gospel that we hold so dear. Now, before I read, I want to encourage you that you might want to look at the screen as I'm reading these verses instead of looking at your Bibles. I say that because I have uh, on the screen, I am putting the words of the objector. So this is the person who's making the objections against Paul. Their words are in yellow and the words of Paul are in white. And I hope that by doing it, it can add a little bit of clarity to these verses. So here is the third objection to Paul's teaching in Romans 3, 5 through 8. But if our unrighteousness demonstrates the righteousness of God, what shall we say? The God who inflicts wrath is not unrighteous, is he? I am speaking in human terms. May it never be, for otherwise how will God judge the world? 
But if through my lie the truth of God abounded to his glory, why am I also still being judged as a sinner? And why not say, as we are slanderously reported in some claim that we say, let us do evil that good may come. Their condemnation is just. Paul here deals with an objection to the gospel that was consistently repeated in his own day, that was repeated again against Martin Luther in the time of the Reformation, and is still repeated today against the gospel that we preach at Grace Community Bible Church. And the three objections in verses 5, 7, and 8, I believe you can summarize them up into one question. And the question is, since righteousness is not by works, since I can't be saved because of how I live, should I sin all the more to highlight God's holiness and forgiveness? Paul has been emphasizing in section after section in Romans 1.19 through Romans 2.29 that God will judge the sinner. God will judge us all for our sinfulness, for our lack of thanksgiving, for our lies, for our pride, for our hypocrisy, for our lust, and all of our sins. You could say that those sins, our evil, our wickedness, serve as a black background that can highlight the holiness of God and His righteousness in comparison to us. And so some people are saying to Paul, Hey, Paul, apostle guy, if my sins can highlight how holy God is, if my sins can prove the righteousness of God, can I say that my sins are really good? Because if I look worse and worse, doesn't it make the contrast all the brighter and make God seem better and better? If my lies, if my dishonesty showcases God's truth and God's honesty, can't you say that my lies are good? Maybe my lies are even beneficial? Because it makes God's truth stand out with all the more clarity. And to that argument, Paul says, that's dumb. I think that when Paul says, I am speaking in human terms, Paul is meaning to say, your argument isn't even worth a response. It's like giving pearls to swine, but I'm going to get down in the mud. I'm going to be like a human and respond to your foolishness. And Paul's response is simple. It is, no, of course what you're saying is wrong. Our lies do not make God more truthful. Of course, we should not be rewarded for our unrighteousness because our sin is the back cloth set behind God's holy light. We're not displaying diamonds here. We are talking about the holy character of our God and he doesn't need our sin to highlight his glory. If we were to reward or bless, or even simply pass over our sin. Because it shows how righteous God is in comparison to us. If that were the case, God could not be in a position to judge the world at all. And the end result would be that wickedness and evil would prosper. Sin would end up ruling over holiness. And may that never be. And others say we shouldn't be judged at all by sin as sinners. Because the more we sin, the more glorious God looks. The more we sin, the more we give God opportunities to forgive. If you really want the world to see how loving and gracious and how forgiving God is, we should encourage others to be cruel and vindictive and selfish so that they can see how much sin God will forgive. And to this line of thinking, Paul has nothing more to say than your condemnation is just. It is just and it is right 
to condemn that idiotic line of thinking. Because it is clear. There is no benefit to a faithless lifestyle. There is no goodness that comes as a result of sin. Now, our sin may highlight God's holiness. Our depravity may showcase the abundance of his forgiveness. But there is never one instance in the scripture where anyone is encouraged to sin in order that God may be glorified in his holiness. And here, I think, is where it is important to have sound theology, and that is to have a proper view of God that is based upon what the scriptures teach and not based upon what the world says about our God. And one thing that the scriptures teach us about our God is that our God is eternal, and in his eternality, he is unchangeable or immutable. This means that God is the same in his character yesterday today, and he will be forever. God, his name is Yahweh. And the name Yahweh, the name of the Lord, means the great I am. In the most fundamental statement regarding the character and the person of God, God himself says to Moses, I am who I am. That's that name Yahweh. And he said, Thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, I am has sent me to you. The Lord is Yahweh. He is the same. That means he is the same I am from the dawn of time until the end of time. His character will never change. Therefore, he doesn't need you to display his righteousness. He doesn't need you to display his faithfulness because based upon his immutability, God will always be loving and gracious and kind and forgiving because that is who he is. Our sinfulness does not display or add to the character of God because in his faithfulness, God is not like us. Now, there could be some well-meaning people or some not-so-well-meaning people who believe that God does need to prove himself. God does need to prove that he is loving or forgiving. And this is where we always need to remind ourselves that God is not like us. I may need to prove my righteousness to you, I may need to prove to you that I am someone who will forgive, who will be faithful. You need to prove your character to others. But the only reason we need to do that is because of our nature. And our nature is that we are fallible. We have fallen and we are sinful. I mentioned about a month ago how God provided for our family a a swimming pool in our backyard after I initially fell for an eBay scam. And I got to say today that after a couple of weeks of pool ownership, I'm really struggling right now with if God provided this pool for my kids' joy or if God provided us this pool in order to test my perseverance and my long suffering. Because our backyard pool has been one headache after another. At first, I thought I could unpack it and throw it anywhere out on our backyard. And after I got ready to set it up, I quickly read on the instructions that said, do not set up pool, do not place pool on St. Augustine grass. And if you live in the community here, you know that all of our grass and our lawns is only one kind of grass, and that's St. Aug. And so I had to spend an entire weekend tearing up grass in a large portion of my yard. And then I installed a new filter on the pool shortly after getting it up. I installed a sand filter, uh, but I skipped one step in the installation process. And when I first turned it on to filter the water in my pool, instead of filtering the pool water, it started shooting piles of sand into the bottom of the pool. And that's just two of my what have been daily headaches with this thing. And I hate to say it, 
But throughout this process, I have been a not very nice husband and father whenever I was out in the backyard working on the pool. My patience was pushed past its breaking point. My nerves were shot, and I took out some of my frustration on those I loved most, my wife and my kids. I was not acting like the loving and supporting father and husband I know that I should be. And so now for my family, if I want to show them that I am a loving father, I need opportunities to display my love to them again. If I want to show them that I am a patient father, I will need opportunities again to show them that I am patient. If I want to show them that I am a forgiving father, I will need opportunities to show them that I am forgiving. It's because I am a fickle person. I am not always kind. I am not always patient. I am not always good. So I need opportunities to show my goodness, to show my love. And God is not like me. God is not like you. The Lord is faithful. He is perfect and he is unchangeable. Therefore, God does not need us to sin, us to fall in order to prove who he is, in order to define his character because he is the I am. He will always be faithful to himself and in himself he is holy and perfect and good and loving and gracious. And he will be the same person tomorrow that he is today that he was yesterday. We need to be people who cling to this reality that the Lord is faithful. Because God's faithfulness will always allow us to be confident in his character and in his promises, regardless of what circumstances come into our lives today. So I hope that through these objections to Paul's teaching, that this won't be a time of frustration, that we're not continuing to push through to this argument on the gospel. But may this be an opportunity for us to just pause and rejoice in the fact that our God is faithful to us. Please stand for the benediction. Lord, I ask that your face would shine upon your people, that it would shine in your faithfulness, and that when we feel like we need a rock this week, when we feel like we need to stand on something that won't be shaken, may we stand and rest upon you. And in Jesus' name I pray, amen.